two stories remain as unbeatens collide for the title. Gonna get any more dramatic. Jim Harbaugh and the Wolverines are looking to finish the mission, while Michael Penix Jr. and the Huskies hope to write their perfect ending. The final chapter, and the stakes couldn't be higher. A new playoff champion will be crowned the College Football Playoff National Championship. Number one Michigan versus number two Washington, Monday at 7.30 Eastern on ESPN. With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. <gasps> no, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hello and welcome to The Paddock in the Pavilion with Stephen Wallace. In each show, Stephen will interview someone connected to the world of horse racing or cricket. Hello, everyone. In our second podcast about the Grand National, I was joined by Donald Swan, who rode his own horse simulator in the 1975 Grand National. Donald talked about his dream of riding in the world-famous race, his son Charlie's exploits at Aintree, and his future hopes for grandson Harry. If you like stories, you will definitely enjoy my chat with Captain Donald Swan. Hello, Donald. Thanks for joining me on the paddock and the pavilion. Well, Stephen, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's great. I understand from one of your relatives that you could have been an actor. Well, um, I did help my sister with her interview for RADA and... uh, when we got the answer back, she passed, and, and they said, would I also go to Rada? Because I had did a Hamlet uh, for them for uh, the interview. But my father said, no, Donald, you can't go, but uh, said yes to my sister. <laughs> so I wasn't an actor. Well, just think if you if you had have gone, you'd never have ridden in the Grand National, and we're going to come come on to that later. Well, possibly, um, I suppose so. But uh, I always uh, love riding, so uh, you know it, it was always in the back of my mind. Have you recovered from last week and Cheltenham watching on the sofa? Well, it was a magic Cheltenham. Uh, particularly for me, because I know the De Bromheads very well, and Henry, who'd lost a son, and Honeysuckle winning the mayor's hurdle, and, of course, uh, Nicky Henderson with Constitution Hill, um, which is Charlie's sort of bet. He said, Dad, you could put the farm on, on this horse. And and it obliged, and it's a new Isterbrack, I think. But anyway, it was a wonderful magic uh, Cheltenham. Well, I'd like to take you back to 1975. I know that's a long time ago, when you rode Zimulator in the Grand National. God. And you 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 bred him and and you trained him. Is that right? Yes, I did. Um, when I came to Ireland first, I brought two mares for flat racing and one was the mother of Zimulator and uh, he grew and grew and grew as a baby as a foal and uh, he was he was too large and too backward for flat racing so I trained him for the national hunt and we won uh, a bumper with him, which is the two mile amateur riders, which I rode him in. And he won that by eight lengths. And he then qualified for the national by winning the amateur race at Punchestown, which was a listed race, which you had to win in those days to qualify. So, anyway, <laughs> that's how we started. 
I'd love to ask you about a story when um, Zimulator ran in the Leopards Down Chase in uh, 1974, involving um, a, a, a police car and um, a, a, a driver that was driving quite fast. I don't know where you got that from, but it's, it's, it's nearly true. Yes, we came, we were celebrating after having been placed. And uh, we were driving very late back, and it was nothing on the roads in those days anyway, on the motorway. And I was going too fast, and a police car came by. Uh, behind me and I thought oh I better slow down so I did he turned off into a housing estate so then I could said he's gone I can put my foot down and I was doing I think over a hundred down the motorway it was four o'clock in the morning and uh, he came out again and tried to overtake me so I went even faster and and he he gave up, so I thought that's all right. So I went on, and then at a junction, there was police cars everywhere. So that I had to stop. And the <laughs> sergeant said, uh, "Who are you?" And I said, "I'm Mr. Swan from uh, Nina." And he said, "No, you're not." Your Captain Swan from Doc Jordan, who had a horse running at Leopardstown in the Leopardstown chase, and I backed it. And if if it had, was going as fast as your game down the motorway, I'd have won a lot of money. <laughs> anyway, I gave him a tip for Gorham Park on the Wednesday, and, and, and fortunately we won. And uh, he dropped the he dropped the charge. <laughs> I was safe. But you could do you see in those days you could do that, but not not now. <laughs> yeah. No, I think we can let you off now. It is um trying to work out how long ago that is. That's twenty six, nearly fifty years ago. Yes. Yes. So so was it always your dream to ride in the Grand National? Yes, it was. Uh at the age of eight, I got uh, delirious when I had uh, scarlet fever very badly. And my father used to read me the book of Right Royal by John Macefield. And uh, uh, I sort of, it was a dream that I always wanted then to win the Grand National. You were there in. 1975 on your own horse simulator and uh, the i've seen the recording and the, the starter is uh, appealing to jockeys to not go too fast and uh, <laughs> captain captain swan on simulator charges off to the first fence yes well it was a bad start you see we got down to the start all right and then somebody lost a shoe going down and we all had to get off our horses, which was a bore. And uh, we sat on the fence and, and we had to wait till the horse got to reshod. And the horse that got reshod fell at the first fence. So anyway, but we I got a good start. And I it was a horse that I trained um, on its own a lot. So it liked to be in front. I even hunted hounds off it. And uh, uh, so I sort of said, Master, please, and off we went. You led for three fences, four fences, before you fell. (laughs) That's right. He just tipped the fourth fence, and he couldn't get his front legs out, his sort of uh, undercarriage. And he tried and tried, but then bowled over. It took him a long time to fall. How were you? Did you get injured or...? Yeah, I did. And this is a, a, quite a funny story. Um, I got a bit of concussion because I'd lost my hat. I don't know how, but it, it, it had broken. And and I got concussion, I suppose. And 
I sort of woke up, and the fields are all gone, of course, and the horse too. And uh, a fellow said, and I, uh, he was an Irishman, he said, do you want a lift? And I said, I want to go to Clock Jordan. And he said, well, you better get in because I'm from Nina, which is a town only a few miles away from us. So he knew me. And <laughs> otherwise, I wouldn't have got in, I don't think. But I was all right anyway. And the you, horse was all right, yes. Did I you manage to watch the race? Oh, I did. Yeah. After the two days. Many times. Yes, many times. <laughs> A young Charlie Swan, I think he's seven at the time, was watching at home. Yes, I think he uh, burst into tears, I think, on his mother's knee and <laughs> when he saw his father <laughs> laid out cold. With the 1975 Grand National, Red Rum was going for his third win. Do you remember? Yes. Yeah. Do you remember all that, you know, the, the, the publicity about oh. that when you're in the, the parade ring? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's all, it's all about Red Rum. Yeah, it was. Yes, very much so. And you're on the 100 terrific. to 1 outsider simulator. <laughs> well, I'd have to be. <laughs> he was only a novice, but he, he had won the Inglesby. I won the Inglesby well with him. I beat Ted Walsh, I think. He, uh, he was on the, on the runner-up or something. So uh, it was quite a... You know, but I mean, I, it, we wouldn't have been in that class. And you got down to ten stone for that race in 1975. Yeah, I did. I had to had had to go down to nine seven, you know, in rail weight, and that you know, having played rugby at thirteen stone, um, was quite a lot, a lot of weight to lose. The the following year, you broke your leg, so you you weren't able to ride in the 1976 Grand National? Well, that's it. I mean, he was only a novice that year. And I thought, also, he had a great school. He went right round for a whole circuit, jumping the fences. So he had a nice, loose school. Um, and I thought, well, that'll do him a lot of good for the following year. But unfortunately, I had a very serious accident to my legs and couldn't break it in four places. Um, I couldn't ride, I'm afraid, in in the following year. But he he turned into a very nice chaser, and and did really well for me. How did you how did you get into to riding? Ah, uh, well, I've always rode as I was a, a little boy at four, and went through Pony Club and loved uh, uh, going across country. Uh, hunting and then uh, joined a cavalry regiment and continued riding. Went to the uh, school for veterinary in Melton Mowbray, the remount uh, place, and uh, learned a lot more about breaking horses and, and um, so I've always, always had ridden as a, a youngster. Spent I, some uh, time with Toby Bolding, I think, the Grand National winning yeah. trainer. Yes, you're quite right. I was stationed at Lowell, and I wanted to, I'd been show jumping and cross-country riding, um, and I wanted to learn more about uh, race riding and over jumps. And he said, my colonel said, I know Toby Balding. We'll meet at Newbury. And we met Toby at Newbury Races. And he said, come up and, and you can ride out for me. And uh, I did that as, when I was at Lulworth at the gunnery school for tanks and armoured cars, learning as an instructor. And uh, I had valid information about race riding from uh, Owen McNally, who was the head lad at Toby's, and, of course, Eddie Harty, who rode Highland Wedding to 
win the national. And uh, I learned all my little bits from Toby Holding, who rang me up and said, I've got a ride for you in the Wells point to point. No, in the, yes, in the point to point. Uh, he's a pub owner. Would you go and ride his horse? And I said, Of course I would. Um, am I, do you think I'm able for it? He said, I think you are. So I went down to the pub, and he owned, the pub owner owned this horse. It was the hunt race, so he was very keen that he should win it. And we had a, uh, we had a, a drink on it, and he said, I'll see you in the ring. And <laughs> off we went. And in the ring, I sort of asked the person who was holding the horse and, and walking it round the parade ring, the paddock, and I said, um, has it schooled and uh, over fences? And he said, oh, well, it's hunted, you know. And so I said, oh, well, that should be all right. He, he said, uh, but it hasn't come in for very long. We've only had it in six weeks. So you might find it gets rather tired. So I said, well, that's all right. We'll, we'll do our best. And off we went. And it was an amazing ride. We, we came to the first, there were only six runs. And we came into the first fence. And the horse never took off at all and fell. So I was on the ground, and I found three other jockeys on the ground also. And one of them, a great friend of mine, said, oh, thank God that's over. I, I didn't want to ride my horse. But the pub, all the, the supporters of the pub had found my horse and brought it back to me. And so I was heaped up on, on top of it again and got to the second fence, and there were there was only two of us, I think, in it. And the favourite was in front anyway. And it jumped over. And I, I followed it. And, and then suddenly it got a, sort of into a river. And it started to do all right. And off we went. And then uh, the front horse was sort of, again, I was gaining on it. And, and it, we were sort of six legs behind it. And the horse fell. <laughs> so I suddenly found myself uh, jumping the fence in the lead. And uh, uh, anyway, my horse got very tired. And by this time, the, uh, the favorite had, had remounted again, like I had, and was catching me. And my horse was tiring, and we went from a gallop to a canter <laughs> and jumped the last, like a show jump, and uh, then down to a walk. <laughs> it's an eventful race. <laughs> and, and we won the race. We won the race, literally walking past the winning best. And the, uh, um, what was it? Oh, um, it yeah. wasn't the sporting life. It was the... Uh, a uh, uh, field wrote it up as the biggest goon show of the season. <laughs> so, but anyway, that was my first point to point win and my only ride in Ireland, I mean, in England at that time. So, it was my first win. When you finished riding, you then went to become a trainer and you, yeah. you, you, you trained Charlie's first win as a 15 year old. Well, I did. I mean, Charlie was a natural, and he was very light. And and as I said, after my remount uh, education and training, we broke this horse, and I got it, you know, jumping and, and lunging on two reins and, and things. And Charlie was very kindly, when school holidays would, would come and ride it, and I left it with him, and I said, "Look, you know, he was—he'd done very well pony racing, 
So he knew how to ride well, um, race riding. And uh, I left him with it. And I said, look, I'm apprenticing you. You can, you can ride it at the age of 15. And the horse was having its first run. And Charlie was having his first ride in, in, in a race uh, uh, under rules. And we were badly drawn right on the outside in the stalls. Five furlongs sprint uh, for two year olds. And I said to Charlie, We'll walk, of course. I got him in the stalls where he was going to jump out. Now, look at the winning pace. That's a straight line. That's where you're going. He said, That's very close to the chase fences. I said, Well, that's all right. Um, you're not, <laughs> you're not going to jump. You, uh, uh, you're going to go in a straight line. Don't go over to the to the inside where the hurdle course was, and, and it was very cut up. It had been raining all March uh, up until about the, the middle. This was the 19th of March, so it hadn't had time to dry out. Don't go over there because it'll be very rutty and. That's where all the rest of them went. And Charlie came up under the thing and was never seen by the commentator until the end of the race, and he won it by eight legs. <laughs> so it was terrific at 20 to 1. Was Charlie always going to be a jockey? Well, that's all he wanted to do. He wasn't going to be an academic um, from his schooling, and he loved his riding. And he was very good at it. So uh, when he formed up to my wife and I at 16 and said I, he wanted to leave school, I said, Oi, um, you haven't got in any exams, no uh, results to, you know, what happens if you're not a very good job? He said, Dad, don't worry. He said, whatever I do, I'll do well. So <laughs> what, what could you say? I said, okay, well, then go for it. And I said, well, you can't stay here because I didn't have any many horses for him to ride. Yeah, you've got to do the job properly. You better be an apprentice. So we took him up to Kevin Prendergast, the Curra, and launched him there. There were 13 uh, little apprentices in front of him. One was Karen Fallon, who was champion jockey in England for many seasons and rode derby winners and things. But uh, they went together as a, an apprentice for Kevin Prendergast, and they went the two ways. I got a lovely picture of them both riding a two-year-old for me and both of them together, one going to England and the other being champion jockey in Ireland. Well, he became famous. He was nine-time Irish champion jockey and is famously yes. associated with Isterbrack, a three-time winner of the champion hurdle. Were you at Cheltenham on each of those occasions when he won the champion hurdle? I was for the first one and the third one, the last one. I wasn't there for the second one, but uh, it was a marvellous occasion. And, I mean, he rode him 28 times. You know, he was the only jockey to have ridden him, you know. And, okay, he fell a couple of times on him, but uh, he rode him, rode him all the time. It was It was wonderful. If it hadn't have been for foot and mouth, would he have won in 2001? Well, I'm quite sure he would. He was in terrific form that time. He won the Irish champion hurdle very easily. Um, and there was no reason why he shouldn't. And returning to Aintree, were you ever nervous when Charlie's riding over those big fences? Yes. I mean, naturally, one there. <laughs> Yeah, having, uh, I think, Teresa, probably my wife, was more worried 
but uh, no, totally. he he was he, you know, it was one race that he wished to win too. Um, but uh, sadly, he he was second in the race that never was on Car Villahan for Mouse Morris. Um, so that's a fur. He was third and fourth, I think, in the. But he, he had nine times a ride in the national. But we, is the one race he wanted to win, but he never did. But he also wanted to get further than the fourth fence, didn't he? <laughs> ah, well, you see, I used to t- tease him. He said, "You've never." You've never led the national for four fences, <laughs> and, he, and then actually he did. He, he did lead in one of the races that he rode in, and he said, "Dad, I did. I, I managed to beat your record." <laughs> yeah, I'd recommend yeah. anyone who wants to watch um, the 1975 Grand National. I can guarantee they'll see Captain Donald Swan. <laughs> in that race because you're 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 leading for those four fences and you you That's mentioned nice. you mentioned your wife Teresa there but uh, Teresa being a challenger that the challenger they're renowned for their flat right flat racing aren't they not jump racing <laughs> yes but still you know i mean it's only because your size really the flat racing jockeys are much smaller you know charlie would have loved to have gone on on the flat his weight, his weight, put him through to the natural hunt. Uh, he, he fought it for a long time, but couldn't. And I said, "Look, you don't live on an apple a day in the sauna. Uh, that wouldn't be right for your health." And and I think he was right, you know, to to go natural hunt and and do it do it well. How would you describe your own riding style to, in, compared to Charlie's? Oh, completely different. I was, a, 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 you know, just did it for fun and loved it. But he, he was much more skillful. He had the gene of the challenges, which is my wife's side, of, of, of the fl- flat racing. And, uh, you know, it was t- totally different. I was I was a buffoon rider, you know, just you know, in his terms, as an amateur, you know, I just loved it. Yes, Teresa's uh, grandfather was George Challoner, who was placed in the Derby, and George Challoner's father, Tom, uh, won the Derby in eighteen sixty three and nine other ten classics altogether. That's right, ten classic, well, five ledgers and. A Derby and of two thousand guineas and Oaks twice or something. Yeah, you did. I mean, he, he that side, the racing side uh, of Charlie comes from the dam line. Yes. And what's it now like having a grandson as a jockey in Harry? Well, <laughs> well, I'll pass her over to Teresa on that one. But uh, it's, I mean, it is a. He, Harry loves it, and he rides t- very similar to Charlie. He, it's a very the techniques the same, and he can judge pace, and you know he's got lovely hands. Um, I hope he does very well. I'm sure he'll he'll possibly uh, turn professional one day. And the Grand National uh, coming up, you'll be watching as ever. Yes, of course. It's one uh, he probably most people in Ireland will be also watching. <laughs> you know, it's it's a it's a race, it's a unique race, and it, it's it's a fantastic race in all its you know it's all it, it, it's fabulous. But in many ways, different to when you rode the course in nineteen seventy five. Oh yes, they they were much bigger fences then. They were because the drops had, um, were were larger and and steeper. Uh, but it's all for safety, and and I think it's a good thing. You know, everything is uh, progressive, and and I think the national course has has must fall in line and and be the same. You know, it's safety. Well. 
Thank you very much, Donald, for, for joining me on the show. Just think you could have been a famous actor, but uh, you became <laughs> uh, the father of a famous jockey. Yes, yeah, I'm quite right. No, it was lovely. I've been very proud of him. And, and um, uh, he, he, he's done, he uh, did. I mean, and uh, he, he, he's always been a, a wonderful rider, and he still is, actually. Loves it. Well, thank you very much for being on the paddock and the pavilion. <laughs> well, thank you. Anyway, I hope I've have waffled on too much, but it's been a. Uh, we've had oh, a little bit of history for you. Um, the house we live in at, at Madrini, Clock Jordan. Uh, when Charlie was born, he was born in the house, and we had a marvelous. Irish uh, doctor, who was a family doctor, who uh, was fairly ancient. And he then said uh, for his last home birth, he talked John, he would uh, be there to deliver the baby from from my wife, Teresa. So I said, that would be lovely. Because he was, uh, he, he, his, he was a racing man and a hunting man and a great horseman in his day. And we got him in. We had a, a midwife who was from Clock Jordan, too. So it was a home team day. And he arrived at the house when I rang him, and he said he would love a whiskey at first. So we had a little Scotch whiskey. And uh, then the midwife shouted, Doctor, uh, I think it's coming. The baby is coming. And ah, said the doctor, we'll have another one, I think, a little whiskey again. So he had another whiskey and eventually got up because the nurse was uh, shouting quite loudly now. And it's on, on its way. And he then was... Uh, washing his hands and his soap and quick doctor the baby's coming coming and of course he hadn't got time to wipe his hands and he took the baby in of course like with his hands full of soap he shot out of his hands and I scored a try caught the baby before it crashed to the floor and scored a try in the corner of the bedroom so it was a great and he said my God, the doctor said, uh, it's surely, surely you'll be a champion jockey. Because there was a champion jockey also, who Brown Marshall in the in the fifties, uh, who won the uh, Grand National. He, he won the National, yes, twice. And he was born in the same house as Charlie uh, in Madrid, our house that I bought in. 65. So that was amazing, wasn't it? <laughs> but we didn't, but poor Charlie hasn't won, the, he didn't win the national. Perhaps Harry will. Yeah, well, I don't know whether Harry was born in that house. So, uh... no, he wasn't. No, he was born in Dublin. But uh, it was uh, remarkable, wasn't it? The two, two champion jockeys should be born. I thought it would be interesting history for you. Oh, it's a great story. Let, let's hope that uh, one day Harry Swan <laughs> rides in the Grand National and wins the Grand National, unlike his father oh. and grandfather. Would well, that be lovely? That would be lovely. That would be great. Well, thank you, Stephen, very much. Thank you for listening to The Paddock and the Pavilion. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at The Pad and Pad. Don't forget, if you like the show, please do leave us a rating and review. Sports Social Podcast Network. With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. 
In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.